Welcome to The Crossing Online. So glad you're here today. We're here to connect you with our church and more importantly, God, no matter where you are at today. We hope today that you can have an experience with Christ like never before, and that through that experience, you'll grow closer in your intimate, personal relationship with Him. Today, we're in our new series called Please Stand By. What does the Bible say about the end of the world and how does that shape and change our lives? I can't wait to get into it. But before that, let's spend some time in worship.
is all I have, this is all I need, this is everything, Christ in me, this is all I have, this is all I need, this is everything, Christ in me, this is all I have, this is all I That's kind of scary, and what is going on? <laughs> I want to welcome all of you to the cross. How are you doing today? You doing all right? Man, it's good to be in the house of the Lord with the people of the Lord, and I'm welcoming all of you at across all of our locations throughout this region. So thankful for you to be able to lift the banner of the name of Jesus high. We just sang about that, and uh, we get to do that, and you know, we need to be doing that because... The truth is that now the end is coming down there. We all need to be ready for that, and we want everybody we know and love to be ready for that as well. You know, I am so excited about what God is accomplishing in and through His people all through this region. Region, you know, I, I, I've been able to go to camp and I, I watch these uh, uh, young people taking this deep dive into the Word of God. Just. Yesterday I was at camp and it was uh, kindergarten and first graders there with their parents. It was uh, full to capacity and it was over 50% dads. I thought that was awesome. Praise God for that. Doing discipleship together with their little kids. So awesome. I've seen that happen week after week. I'm excited about what God's doing through our develop program. When we initially decided to do that, this full-time internship program, we thought we would do 10. We would do 10 full-time internships. And as we started moving through the Wreck the Roof campaign, we decided we needed to bump that up to 20. And, uh, you know, I really believe that, that that line would form. We've had over 50 applications. There's so many younger people in am amongst us in our midst that are saying, give me an opportunity to show what God has placed in my life because I want to serve him full time. And I just think that's awesome. I praise God for that. You know, it's awesome. It's incredible. And um, I think about these new locations that uh, are coming up starting to launch this fall uh, where people are going to be attracted for the first time to an intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And uh, I'm excited about that. And you know, that's because we're able to do things like camp and the develop program, and uh, these new locations, and so many other things that you're seeing across our campuses where we're making dust and, and uh, you know, fixing up the old dogs and making them like young pups again. All of that's happening because so many people stepped out and said, okay, Lord, wreck my roof. I want you to do something in me, and then I want you to move that through me into the lives of other people. And God is blessing that in incredible, incredible ways. And there are so many stories, so many stories about that. And I just want you to be encouraged by the story of the Haley's uh, who go to the Macomb campus. So watch your screens right now and listen to them. My name's Nathan. This is my wife, Sarah. We've been going to the Crossing Macomb since it's opened in 2007. We have three kids, Owen, seven, 
Ethan 5 and Molly 2. Leading into Wreck the Roof, um, probably a couple months beforehand, um, we had found out that our son, Owen, um, he, had been, he had been diagnosed with this autoimmune disease. He was struggling walking, doing simple things, and we just, we were looking for answers. We were, you know, going everywhere to try to find, you know, the solution to our problem. About a week and a half uh, leading into the advanced commitment night, we had just been to Iowa and seen a new doctor, and she finally was one that gave us hope. Um, that you know we have you know there was light at the end of the tunnel wreck the roof came advanced commitment night we we went in we'd already had our commitment written down we had we had we had decided you know we're not in a position right now um, you know we don't know how much you know medical expenses are going to be we don't know how you know we don't know how they're going to work out our initial commitment was not wrecking a roof it was just yeah, we'll do a little here and there, you know. I heard God telling me that Nathan, you need to you need to trust me. Mm -hmm. If we didn't go to that night, we wouldn't be sitting here right now. Sometimes it just it takes one moment for God to finally just move in your life to say enough's enough. You've been trying to do this on your own, and you're failing miserably. One thing that people get hung up with is the fact that somehow having finances gives you security. So we want to keep control of it. And just like with our children, we wanted to keep control of how to treat our son Owen, what medicines to allow him on. Um, that control, we try to see that as a way to stay rooted and steady in a world that, you know, sometimes you go through storms. And through this whole process, God has really just wrecked our roof by saying, you know what, anything that you're trying to hang on to for control is going to fall apart because that's shifting sand. I'm the only rock that you can really stand on. But my encouragement would be expect the up and downs and just fix your eyes on Jesus and the truth that he is always with you and is always going to love you, will never forsake you, and that all things will work together for your good because that's the way he planned it. Um, one thing that had held us back from giving our whole hearts over to Wreck the Roof, I think was just a series of excuses like, well, how much time is this really going to take up on the weekends? And well, if I give more, then what am I going to have to give up? And just the fear of um, how is this going to impact my family? and what if it's in a negative way? You know, what if we regret this halfway through? And I think that the enemy just tries to heap up all of the excuses and the fear that you can think of and just tries to um, do everything he can to keep you from moving forward. Um, but I think we've really seen that if you can put up your shield of faith and push all the excuses aside, God is really going to honor that. God can do amazing things with what we have and what the church has and we just need to acknowledge that and give it over to God. Sorry, isn't it? And you know what that story should do? It should encourage you. If, uh, if you have made that commitment and you're one of those people that said, yeah, I Lord, I want you to do something in me and through me. I've been asking you that and, and you've been providing and we're walking that road right now. Let that encourage you to keep on that path, to keep moving forward. And if you're new to uh, the crossing or you weren't really ready to make that a commitment. I want to encourage you through this to take a look. It's exciting what God's doing, and He'll do that in you and through you. You can go to wrecktheroof.org, and there's all these videos and all these different ways that you can connect to what the rest of us are doing. We want you to be a part of that. We encourage you to think about it. With, with all this good news that I'm talking about, it seems kind of counterintuitive, doesn't it, a little bit to talk about the end of the world? 
Because that's like so negative. Like, why do I want to talk about that? But I think it's important that we are all ready. Like the, the worst thing, to, one of the worst things that happens to me is when I'm blindsided. Do you know what I mean? When something just, just happens to me at all, and like somebody says something or does something, I'm completely unprepared for it and it has me off balance. And I know that that is a very uh, uncomfortable feeling for all of us. And sometimes maybe that happens to you, then you get in your car later because you don't say anything, and then you have this whole conversation with the person when they're not there in your car. Have you ever done that? Oh, yeah. It's like, oh, then you come up with all the good comebacks, you know, that you didn't have at the... Because we don't, because we don't like being blindsided. We don't like that. And I want us to be ready for this, and Jesus does too. And that's what we're going to be exploring today. And the perfect place to explore that is on the Mount of Olives. Now, many of us have never been to the Mount of Olives, and so you, you don't know why that's important, but it's actually where some of the most important events in history took place. So I want to show it to you, what it looks like today. So this is a Google Earth down on the ground kind of look at the Mount of Olives. This is what you'd see if you were there. You see this twisty winding road. You can see it like going here and then it goes down here. It actually twists all behind these trees and goes quite a ways that way. But this is actually the way that Jesus took on the cult of a donkey on Palm Sunday. And at the bottom of this hill, this is the Kidron Valley that runs along here. And this is your close to the top of the mountain is uh, when you get closer to the bottom is the Garden of Gethsemane. It's up on the hillside. And then you'll see there's the, the Eastern Gate or the Golden Gate. In the book of Acts, it was called the Beautiful Gate. And then behind that, now you see this is the Temple Mount. This is the Dome of the Rock. The actual temple used to stand to the right of that, right there. And then you can barely see it, but there's a big giant gray dome back here. And that's the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. Uh, one of the sites where Jesus was said to have been crucified and then buried and rose from the dead. So you can kind of see all of this is really compressed into this, uh, into this tight space. If you look down here, you can see all these boxes. They look like concrete boxes. Those are all tombs. And uh, I want you to uh, just scan around and see what it looks like all the way around us. Okay, so these tombs, they just go on for miles. Keep going, just keep on going. And this is the Kidron Valley going down. This is the Hinnom Valley. You keep going, and there's more and more tombs. And uh, keep going, keep going. And you're, this is pretty much the top. You can't really tell from here, but this road is extremely steep. You can wave to that guy in the car. How you doing? You know. All right. So uh, let's just spin all the way back around. And uh, while you're doing that, let me just share with you some of the things that have happened in this location. Before Jesus was born, in the Old Testament, the book of Ezekiel, it talked about the glory of the Lord or the presence of the Lord that would come down like a cloud over the temple. And there was so much sin and so much against God that was happening. The, uh, the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel the prophet said that the glory of the Lord left. It literally left Jerusalem. And it, it talks about uh, the glory of the Lord going out from the temple, out the eastern gate, and come, going up and leaving from the Mount of Olives. Let's read it in Ezekiel chapter 11. It says, The glory of the Lord went up from within the city and stopped above the mountain east of it. So the mountain east of it is the Mount of Olives. So the glory of the Lord stopped there like he was taking a look and then went back uh, to heaven. It was also the site of Jesus' final sermon uh, before uh, his passion before he was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane and then taken to the cross. And it's called the Olivet Discourse. Uh, some people call it the Small Apocalypse Sermon. And it's uh, Matthew chapter 24 and chapter 25. It was the starting place, as I said, where he entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. And they threw the branches and the palm leaves before him to keep the colt of the donkey from slipping. And uh, we read about that in Luke 19. It says, when he came near the place where the road goes down, the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. It's uh, also the place where he came the night that he was betrayed. And it was a normal place for him to come and pray they're close to the base of it at the Garden of Gethsemane. We read about that in Luke 22. 
It says, Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them and knelt down and prayed. It's also the place where his feet last stood before he ascended into heaven. And we read that in Luke 24. It says, when he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, and that's how you know it's the Mount of Olives, because Bethany's just right over the top of the hill, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. And it's also the place where the Bible says he will return to earth When he comes back on the second coming, when he bodily returns to earth and he descends from heaven, the Bible says his feet are going to stand on the Mount of Olives. That's in Zechariah chapter 14. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from the east to the west, forming a great valley and half the mountain moving north and half moving south. Now, I want us to go back to the picture from Google Earth because I want you to see something that to me is very profound. When I stand here, and I've stood here four times, four different times, from the garden, which is down a little bit below here, you can see that from where he prayed, he could look and he could see the gate that he walked into, the eastern gate, the the, the gate for the prince, it says in the Old Testament, that immediately behind that is the temple the place where he was supposed to be worshipped, where he threw out the money changers, where they would accuse him, and behind that, the place where he was going to be executed, where he was going to be crucified, buried, and rise from the dead. So it was like when he was on the Mount of Olives, he could see his immediate future in a straight line. And when he, when he was crucified back here, up on that cross, facing east, he could look and see his immediate future again. That after he died on the cross and was buried, he'd rise again. He would show himself to his disciples. He would walk out of this eastern gate. He would come through the Garden of Gethsemane, come up the Mount of Olives, and he would ascend into heaven. So it's kind of like he could see time. He could see what was immediately before him from both of those circumstances. So when we talk about time, I think that there's really no better place to be than at least in your mind and your heart on the Mount of Olives. Now, in the first week of this series, Please Stand By, we talked about all these different scenarios about the end of the world, all these different things that are going to destroy us. And what we learned in that sermon was this, don't be afraid, because we get, we get anxious and afraid. You don't need to be afraid, because God holds the future. He holds the future. Nobody else holds the future but God. And 365 times in the Bible, it commands us, and it's the greatest the most commanded thing in the Bible, don't be afraid. Last week, we learned from Clayton that we can capture these moments that we have because life is made up of moments and we want to make the most of them. We want to squeeze every bit of spiritual opportunity out of these moments because you only have a limited number of them on earth. And then we need to understand that the end of the world actually is today for somebody. For somebody in this region, it's today. Jesus is coming back for somebody in our region today. As a matter of fact, 151,600 people will experience the end of the world today and every day because that's how many people die every day. So whether it's Jesus coming back for us or us going to meet Jesus, this is something you want to be prepared for and you don't want to be blindsided by. Listen, have you ever watched a movie, like a really good movie and you're just totally sucked into the movie, like you think you're there and then you see something either on the, on the screen and there's something that's going to happen to the person that you've kind of developed a short-term relationship with? on the screen, and you know it's coming, and you want to like scream and jump into the TV and say, look at that, look at behind you. This is going to, ah, this is going to happen, right? And you're kind of freaky, and if you're at a theater, people are looking at you like you're really strange. Yeah, okay. You've all experienced that before. So here's what I want us to do. I want us to listen to Jesus without being snuck up on. I want us to know what's coming at the end of the world, and then I want us to learn how to live with the knowledge of that, all right? 
And he's going to trust us with that today. So let's go to the place where we can look and we can see the past and the future. And I just want us to comfortably sit down. You're all seated at all of our locations and just think about sitting with Jesus as he's telling you this and listen to the answer. So here's what the apostles asked Jesus. It says, Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives and the disciples came to him privately. It's interesting. So this is like more of a small group than it is like a sermon series. And they said, tell us, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus had just told them that Jerusalem was going to be destroyed and all this stuff. And they're like, oh, hold on, hold on. You're kind of freaking us out. What, what's going to be the sign of your coming? What is going to be the sign of the end of the age? And I totally understand them asking this question. Because just like me, they want to be prepared. You want to be prepared. You don't want to be caught off guard, right? You don't want to be caught unaware. So Jesus then takes this opportunity and uncorks this really incredibly important and scary sermon. And it has really, really big high points in it. And it has some really deep low points in it. It's things that might really frighten us. And depending upon the part you're listening to, you know, it, it could be troubling. And that's why a lot of people don't want to preach Matthew 24 and 25, because it's kind of scary. But I think it's important that we understand what's coming from Jesus' perspective, from the one who's in charge, right? And the first thing he tells us to do in Matthew 24 is be wise. Now we all want to be wise. But he wants us to be wise in a particular way. Because he says there's going to be lots of people that are going to come and they're going to claim to be the Messiah. They're going to, be, they're going to claim to be the answer. They're going to claim to be the one that you need to follow and that one you need to trust in. And he said, don't listen to them. There's only one. And that's me. You need to trust me and not anybody else. Now, we could get into a big discussion about the end times and eschatology and the Antichrist and all this stuff. But what I want to do today is I want to just make it real for you right now. Because an antichrist is anything that you put in the place of Jesus. You hear that? The antichrist is anything that you put in place of Jesus. Now Jesus claimed in John 14 that he was the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. So there's a lot of us that have our own way that we want to go our own way, that we want to do things our way. But Jesus said, I am the way. And so if you put your way or some other way in front of Jesus' way, that's become an antichrist to you. Do you understand? I'm not saying that there won't be one, like a physical one, but I'm saying in your reality, in your life right now, anything that comes in front of Jesus, when it comes to what your way is, is occupying that space. He also said he was the truth. But a lot of us, we want to have our own truth. We want to determine for ourselves what we want to trust in and what we don't want to trust in. We want to be the truth. Or we want to listen to somebody else's truth rather than the truth of Jesus. And that becomes an antichrist to us, a false Christ to us. And we all have a way we want to live. We have something that we've defined as good life or a happy life or a joyful life. But Jesus he defines what that kind of a life is, abundant life and joyful life. He defines that in God's word. And if we're doing something different than that, then that's another false Christ. And he's saying, be wise. Be wise. Some people believe that Jesus, following Jesus, needs to be the path of least resistance. It needs to be easy. Jesus needs to make your life easier. But that's not at all what this sermon teaches and preaches. It says, as a matter of fact, Following Jesus and not following the other things or other people are going to increase your difficulty in life. As a matter of fact, people who follow the true Christ will endure persecution, sometimes severe persecution. We're going to learn about that a little bit. Things will actually get worse and worse. And they'll get really worse. Where he said if those days weren't shortened, nobody would survive. So he's talking about something Really bad that's coming, right? But listen, with that scary part, with that negative part, Jesus says this, and this gospel will be preached into the whole world and then the end will come. And I love that because it gives me hope. Because one of the things Jesus c 
commissioned us, his great commission to us was to go in the world and preach the gospel to everyone. And he's saying, you know what? We're going to hit that target. Even though there'll be this great persecution, the whole world will have an opportunity to hear it. And I love that part of it. So here's my question for you. With regards to wisdom, being wise, what or who are you trusting in right now? What is your way? What is your truth? What is your life? And would you say, Jesus is my way. Jesus is my truth. Jesus is my life. And I'll tell you, if that's what you're actually doing in your life, if that's what you're walking out, you're wise. And if you're not, then that's foolish. Second thing Jesus talks about in this sermon is this. Be ready. Because you have no idea when he's going to return. Let me give you a a, a little bit more insight into that. Even Jesus doesn't know when he's going to return. I thought Jesus knew everything. Nope, he says he didn't know. You know why? Because he's not supposed to. It's all part of God's big plan. When Jesus was talking about coming back, a lot of times he used what we call wedding language. And part of that wedding language had to do with the, the groom coming back for his bride. So he would make an arrangement and, and his bride would have to agree to it and the family would have to agree to it. His next words after that arrangement was made was, I go to prepare a place for you. Then he would go back to his father's house and begin building a home for them, right? Which is what he said to us in John 14. Now he didn't know when he got to come back because every day his father would inspect what he had built and he would look at it and, 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 the, and the bridegroom would say, can I go get her? Can I go, can I, can I go back? Can I go? No, no. You still got some doors to put in and you need to paint that shelf and that isn't quite right yet. And he's like, okay, okay. So then he would go and he'd work hard and then the father would go and inspect again. He goes, can I go get her? Can I go get her? And he'd say, no, no, no. You still got the driveway. I mean, you, don't, you didn't get that. You know, there's some, there's some ornamental shrubbery that needs to go out there. You know, I don't know. But I'll tell you this, God created the world in six days and it was a beautiful place and he's been working on your house for 2,000 years. So it's going to be something awesome. And that's why he doesn't know because only the father knows. And when the father says, go get her, he'll go get her. And he tells this story. In Matthew 24, he tells this story about these 10 bridesmaids. So the, 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 bride, the bride is the bride of Christ, is the church, right? But in his story, it's just a bride during that, in that culture, and she had to have her bridesmaids live with her. Can you imagine some of you uh, ladies having all your... And she had 10. That's a big wedding. So she has 10, and they have to live with her. And they don't know how long they're going to be living with her because they don't know how long it's going to be before the bridegroom is sent back by the father. To get, so they had to be ready because he could come in the daytime. He could come at nighttime. And if he came at nighttime, they needed to have lamps so that they could follow along in the, in the wedding procession to get to the place. And so they all had their lamps. But five of those invited didn't have oil for their lamps, and five did. And when the, when the bridegroom did come back, the ones who hadn't prepared said, can we have some of your oil? And they said, no, we only have enough to get there. You'll have to go get your own. And the end of the story was they were locked out. They missed the wedding. They were invited to the wedding, but they missed the wedding. You don't want to miss the wedding. I don't want to miss the wedding. We need to be ready. Well, there are a lot of people on earth that are re ready, and they're ready Considering the great persecution, you know, because we're living in a great country where we're not persecuted. And even though there's a lot of articles about, you know, all the stuff that happens to Christians in America, it's nothing compared to what happens in the rest of the world. You may not know that between 90,000 and 100,000 Christians are martyred every year, killed for their faith. You may not know that there are 215 million Christians that experience high, very high, or extreme persecution right now. And I would imagine they're the ones that are saying, Jesus, would you please come back today? Please come back today. And then there's those of us that are paying off our mortgage and we want to buy that new car that doesn't smell like cheese sandwiches and Pop-Tarts. And we're saying... Well, you can hold off a while. I'm doing pretty good down here. I kind of like the way I'm living here. It's amazing how persecution will get your eyes up. Looking for your redemption, right? And God only knows when Jesus is coming back. But my question for you today is this. Are you ready? Are you ready? And what does it mean to be ready? Do you have oil in your lamp? 
Do you have oil in your lamp or not? Well, what does that mean? What, 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 what's, what's the oil in my lamp? Well, that's symbolic of the Holy Spirit. Do you have the Holy Spirit inside of you? Is he living inside of you? The invitation's been given. You have the invitation right in front of you. He's invited you to the wedding feast. Are you ready to go? There's some of you at our locations right now that have been kicking the tires of this whole faith thing way too long. It's time to go to the hardware store and buy you some oil. And get ready, get the oil in your lamp, get ready to go because he's coming. He's coming, or you're going to him. You know, that's the most valuable thing that you have. Some of us don't even recognize the most valuable thing we have is an invitation. He invited you. Everybody, listen to my voice. Listen, you're invited. He's opened the doors for all of us. We're invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. The, uh, the, the question is whether or not you're accepting the invitation. Are you ready or not? Are you, have you walked into an intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ or not? That's what it means to accept the invitation. The second most valuable thing he gives us is in the next story, and that's a gift. He doesn't just give us an invitation. He gives us a gift. Some, for some of us, he's given us two gifts. Some of us have five gifts. And in the story Jesus tells in Matthew, he likens those gifts to gold, like this incredible wealth, incredible inheritance, talents of gold, five talents, two talents, and one talent. And he had three servants, and he brought his servants to him, and he gave one five, and he gave one two, and he, he gave one one. And he said, go out. And utilize these for my glory and I'm going to come back and there'll be an accounting. And so the one with five invested and worked and turned it to ten. The one with two invested and worked and turned it into four. And the one who had been given one talent took it out and buried it in the dirt. And when the master came back and asked for an accounting, here comes the one guy with five who had five and now he has ten. And do you know what the master said? Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with little. I'm going to make you faithful in much. Enter into the joy of your Lord. And then one with two had made four. And he says, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in little. Now you're going to be faithful in much. And he gave him more. And the one with one found fault with his master, even accused him and blew the dirt off of it, gave him back the way that he had received it. And the master said, you wicked servant. Take that away from him, give it to the guy with ten, and throw that man out where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's scary. That's a scary end to that story, right? Depending upon what you're doing with your gifts. Now God has no expectation of you to do something with somebody else's gifts. His expectation is for you to do whatever he calls you to do with yours. What are you doing with your gifts? So you have an invitation. You have gifts. He's provided all of that. What are you doing with it? That's the question. So we know what it means to be wise. We know what it means to be ready. And we realize the things that he's given us. But how do you make the most of it? How do you make the most of these incredible things that he's given us? Well, let me give you seven ways. Actually, Jesus in Matthew 25, gives us seven ways to use our invitation and to use our gifts to give him glory. And this is what he said. Enter into the joy of your master because I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was without clothes and you clothed me. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And then the people will say, when did we see you this way? All these different ways. And Jesus says, inasmuch as you've done it to the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Seven ways that you can make the most of your gifts and your, op and your invitation. All right? I was hungry and you came to visit me. I love the story of my friends, Dennis and Brenda Bratton. He used to be a megachurch pastor in Jacksonville, Illinois, uh, Jacksonville, Florida. A lot different than Illinois. <laughs> Florida. 
and had a health problem and retired from the ministry and then started to feel better and wanted to get back into ministry. And he thought, how will I do this now? And the way that he decided to do it was by, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. And he did it in Haiti, one of the poorest, starving. And a lot of what happens in Haiti is relief. It's like you just give something to somebody that helps them in the short term. But he wanted to do something that would help in the long term. So he created a, a micro business that turns into a micro economy. And this is what he did. He formed an organization that gives loans to Haitians to build, and the loan is a $5,000 loan, so that if a Haitian owns his land free and clear, he can build a chicken coop on it. And they give you all the supplies for the chicken coop. They give you the chicks, uh, and they give you their food, and they give you their medicine. All you need to raise chickens. One of the things that's really bad in Haiti is they have no protein in their diet, very low protein in their diet. And so you see all of this malnutrition and death that happens as a result of that. Well, chicken is a great source of protein, right? And so he started doing this micro business and these Haitians started taking it on. And in five years, you pay that $5,000 off. And then if you have family, then you can build a second chicken coop and then a third chicken coop and then a fourth chicken coop. And so all of this chicken then is being raised in Haiti and that gives a food source of high protein to people that are in Haiti. And I remember when he started that and I think there's somewhere now around 300 of those chicken coops in Haiti and it's created an entire microeconomy where you're not just giving someone a meal but you're showing them how to provide meals for everybody around them and their families and it's self-sustaining. How neat is that? I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. You know, I've been connected with Care India for a long time and we talk about Save the Girl and some of these other things that we do there, widows and orphans and, and all of the, these things. But another thing we do is bore wells. We do, we do quite a few of them every year. And in that part of India, the water is brackish, it's salty, so you can't drink it. And the water that the fresh water that are in the rivers uh, are full of disease, and people die of those disease, uh, of those diseases. And so the only way you can get good clean water is through a bore well, which you have to go down pretty far. And you know we've been digging those wells now for quite a number of years, and now there's well over a hundred of them, and millions and millions of gallons of water come out of those bore wells and provide clean, healthy water for all those people in the southern part of India. And that. I mean, I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. So you give a person a chicken, and you help them to teach them how to raise a chicken, and then you tell them about Jesus, the bread of life. And then you, you, you drill a bore well, and people come to their, that bore well to get clean water for the first time that won't kill them, and you tell them about the water of life. And then when you're talking about a person who needs clothes, and you clothe them, I think about our thrift stores. Think about the first one we did, and now there's eight of them all around this region. And we did it for a number of reasons, but uh, one reason was for benevolence for people. Another one was to give jobs to people that might not normally be able to get jobs. Another one was to provide clothing for a dollar or two dollars so people could uh, get clothing. And I know a lot of you shop in those thrift stores. You take your stuff there, you, you, you get rid of your junk, and you buy other people's junk. I know you do it. I know you do it. Yeah, okay, that's fine. That's great. And you know when a person has a tornado that takes down their house or uh, uh, they have a fire and we say, just come in and get what you need. Because I was without clothes and you clothed me. You hearing what I'm saying? Yeah. And I think about all these locations. I think about Monmouth. I think about Jacksonville. I think about all the other locations, these seven new locations that we're going to be raising up through the Wreck the Roof initiative. And I think about all those people that never knew, just like I can remember 20 years ago coming in here and talking about an intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ and people's tears are going down their face and they come up and they talk to me in tears and they go, I never knew that I could actually have a relationship with Jesus Christ. How many people in these other communities don't know that? They're strangers to Jesus. But we create a space and then we invite them in. You're not a stranger here. You're just like the rest of us. Let me introduce you to Jesus Christ. 
right? I think about the medical trips that I've been privileged to take on medical mission trips and just see how people will walk for days and days just to get some sort of medical treatment. And uh, what an amazing experience that is. And then you pray with them and you talk to them about Jesus as you're pulling a tooth that's been killing them for months. Or you're dealing with, I remember a guy had a growth the size of an Idaho potato on his ear. And I was in Haiti and I was with a surgeon. I was holding the light while he cut this thing off and sutured it up. And I ran back to my room and I got my shaving mirror just so that I could show him what he looked like now. And I go, I bet this guy gets a date. You know, check that out. And he just looked at himself and he was transformed. And I I think about I think about the opportunities that come through medical mission trips where we get to minister to people like that. And do I need to tell you about what God can do through the incarcerated people that are around us? But what he does at the Western Illinois Correctional Center, what he does at, at uh, the, uh, uh, the, the youth, the youth uh, the place, the detention home. Well, I'm, I'm trying to think of the name of it. And, and what he does... Uh, at Clayton, at the work camp, what he does at all the places. I'll tell you what he does. Since April 1st, 2015, we've baptized 382 inmates. 382. Who found out that even though whatever they did, whatever they were accused of and whatever they're paying for, whatever freedom that they've lost, that in the midst of being locked up, they can still be free in Christ. Praise the Lord for that. This is how we make the most of our gifts. This is how we make the most of our invitation. So I want to ask you a question. How are you investing your invitation? How are you investing your gifts? Tim LaHaye's book, Left Behind, which was actually a series of books, sold over 80 million copies. 80 million. Four of them were number one on the New York Times bestseller list. One of them opened as number one on the New York Times bestseller list. And you might think that's really awesome, but my question is, even though you people read that for entertainment, what did it really change? How did it change their actions? How did it change the way they saw the world and how they lived in it and the decisions that they made? What did it accomplish? You know, I look at the church today like you do, and I think there's a lot of church that's just big business. You know what I mean by that? And that people are Focus the wrong direction. It's an exercise in self-perpetuation for a bunch of self-centered, self-righteous hypocrites that only want for themselves and their own needs. Perpetual consumers without a commitment to pay it forward. That sounds pretty negative. I understand that. But it's true. It's true. And I think about all the things that God's blessed us with. I think about all these buildings Thinking about that parking lot, 48th Street, it's coming. You're going, oh, praise God for that. It's going to be awesome. Yeah, I'm thinking about all that. And then I think about how Jesus began his sermon in Matthew 24. Listen, he was, point, he was on the Mount of Olives, and he was pointing back to the temple. And he goes, guys, there's not going to be one stone of that temple left upon another. You think God cares about our wonderful tool shed edifices? He didn't care about that temple enough to protect it. He said one stone won't be left on another. And I'm telling you, there's going to come a day when this building and every building you're in all across this region that God has so wonderfully provided for us as a tool to reach out and minister to other people, there will come a time where there won't be one stone left on another with those buildings. That there won't be one two before that's standing up anymore. Everything's going to be raised to the ground and burnt to a cinder. And the only thing that's going to matter are the people in that building that knew Jesus by name. The only thing that's going to matter, the only thing that's going to matter is that they knew who they were in Jesus, that they were a child of God, and maybe they learned it there for the first time. And the only thing that's going to matter is what they saw when they looked out at a world that so desperately needed a relationship with Jesus Christ. We cannot get all focused on these buildings. We've got to remember That Jesus said that this world is on the clock and everything on it is on the clock and he owns it. He created it and he can destroy it and he will. And I'm reminded of those words that say there's only one life and it'll soon be passed. And only what's done 
for Christ will last. I want you to think about that as we move to a time of decision. One thing I love about this sermon is that it's a question we've all asked. We've all been there where we've contemplated what the end of the world would look like, be like, and what our outcome would be. It's the same questions that the disciples were asking. So let me ask you this. When the disciples asked those questions and Jesus told them the same answer that you've just heard, what did they do? They devoted themselves to others. They completely changed their lives in a new and incredible way. It was no longer about them anymore. It was about those that Jesus had talked about. The hungry, the thirsty, those needing clothes, the strangers, the sick, and those in prison. And through that transformation in their lives, they literally changed the course of history. All because they took what Jesus said seriously. Now look at your life. You asked the same question they did, and Jesus gave you the same answer. So what are you going to do about it? Are you going to be like the disciples? Are you going to turn your life upside down and make it about others rather than about yourself? Are you going to look at the hungry, the thirsty, those needing clothes, the strangers, the sick, and those in prison differently because of what you just heard? Or is this just another sermon? Another time to punch in your Jesus card for the day. Just like the disciples, if you take what you just heard and apply it radically to your life, Jesus will use you to change the world. I 100% believe that. The world may be your next door neighbor. It may be your friends from work. It may be a relative that needs Jesus badly in their lives right now. These next two songs, I really want you to spend some time with God, asking yourself this, am I ready to take this Christian life seriously? Am I willing to risk it all for the sake of others? And am I ready to let Jesus lead me through it all? Let's go to him right now. We see the tragedy and beauty of the cross. We feel the mystery and wonder of your love. Lord, we marvel at the gift you gave to us in the spilling of your blood. The spilling of your blood. We see the tragedy and beauty of the cross. We feel the mystery and wonder Through the power of the cross, 
live to see your kingdom come by the power of the cross. All we need it, all we want is the power of the cross to bring us
there was never a time where Jesus wasn't ready. Like Jerry said, when he was standing on Mount Zion, he knew that he was going down a path that there was no turning back from. He knew that that path led to pain and suffering and an ultimate sacrifice, but to him it was worth it. Jesus thought it was worth it to go through everything that he did just for a chance at a relationship with you. We remember that sacrifice every single week by taking communion. So as one church, let's spend some time reflecting on that sacrifice right now. Thank you so much for joining with us today. If you haven't already, hit the Give button at the top of the screen and start being a difference maker in our online community. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me by emailing joeyh.thecrossing.net. I'd love to answer any questions that you have. Once again, thanks for joining, and I'll see you next week.